entitled A Call to Action. And I'm going to try to do in about 10 to 15 minutes five different things. I'm setting myself a strong challenge, and I doubt if I'll be able to do it. So I'm going to list the things up front. So in case I don't do all of them, you can ask me about them later if you're interested. First of all, I want to refer to some of the themes that I heard raised here. I want to tell you how I came to my commitment personally in terms of philanthropy and why I chose to found the Synergos Institute as a vehicle for doing that. To make some observations, since many of us in this room are Americans, about the strengths and weaknesses that we as Americans bring to global philanthropy. That's number three. Number four is to make a few recommendations about how those of us who might be just starting might proceed in getting involved. And finally, to say just a few words about what I see as philanthropist role or niche in promoting development and social justice. So as you can see, this is approximately a, a course that might take an entire semester that I'm going to try to squeeze in a very few words. First, though, I did want to say that it's really nice to see a number of familiar faces. And in some ways, it's even nicer to see a lot of fresh new faces of people who have reflected in their eyes interest, questions, passion, commitment. That is very heartening for one who's been involved in this for a long time to see people coming along who really want to get involved in this field. So I'm going to talk basically about three Ps, passion, personal involvement, and patience. And I'll start with the passion issue because it's so obvious and so clear that to be effective in whatever, not just philanthropy, you need to find what you really care about, what grabs you in your guts. Is it an issue? Is it a region? Is it an organization? And then follow that. For me personally, when I was 17, I had the privilege of living in Brazil and working and ultimately living in a squatter settlement and having the chance to to see what was a formative observation for the rest of my life, which was really obvious when you think about it. Those affected by poverty are those who have the greatest investment in solving it. And if those of us who are not affected by poverty, that is, we didn't grow up in poverty or we're not poor now, don't respond to that and instead go off our own direction and try to think up solutions no matter how brilliant, and impose them on the people who already have the will and the energy to put into solving the problems, then we're working at cross purposes, not together. So for me, that was a formative experience. The second formative experience was uh, from the 80s on getting involved in the anti-apartheid movement and having spent a lot of time in southern Africa with some very remarkable leaders. So that leads me to one recommendation which is to the extent possible, since we're talking about global issues and many of us are American, go live somewhere else. Go spend time in another culture. Get engaged. If you don't like that country or that culture, find another one. But find, find something that really engages you and get to know it well. Now, this might be a good time to, to say a few things about how some of our peculiarly American qualities can cut both ways in terms of um, the issue of what we often call helping. One of our American qualities is we always want to help. Now, this is a delightful quality on the one hand, but actually most people don't like to be helped. They like to participate in what's going on. They like to feel that they're a partner in it. And I think we, a lot of people say about Americans, you're so generous, you know, you're so nice, but the flip side of that is it makes me feel small or it makes me feel like I'm only a needy person. So to the extent that we can use that desire to make a difference, but use it in a way that is enhancing or empowering rather than belittling or patronizing, that would be a very good way to, to turn that basically good quality into something that would be useful. Secondly, we want results instantly. We're 
business people are often very focused on the next quarter bottom line, although I have to say venture capitalists tend to be much more taking the long view. But even venture capitalists, in my experience, want to see change right away. Now, in certain issues, this may be possible. But in the kinds of social change problems and issues that I think we're, we've been addressing here, it just is going to take longer. That is not to say that you can't get intermediary results that are measurable and good concrete results fairly soon. But if we're in this to make the kinds of changes the people who just talked about policy and advocacy were talking about, we're just going to have to accept that our impatience may be useful in terms of making things happen, but that the flip side is that we're just going to have to get used to it taking a longer time. Another quality, and by the way, I'm saying this because I am an American and I suffer from all these qualities, the good side and the bad side. So it's not that I'm saying you have this, I don't. I have it and I've had to work on it a lot. And, and people that I work with through Synergos in a number of different countries have sometimes, for me, painfully made it clear that I needed to work on them. So um, another quality is that we often think we know the answers. And we're very excited about knowing the answers, and we want to communicate them right away. And we're quite offended and hurt if people don't automatically assume that our answers, in fact, might be the right answers for them. So that's another thing we might just take a pause and think about, that maybe there are different answers. Maybe by working together, we can come up with actually wonderful answers, but they may not be exactly what our initial concept of an answer was. Another quality I know extremely well that cuts both ways again is being driven. We are, as a society, incredibly driven. We want to do things. We want to work hard. We work ourselves into the ground. We exhaust ourselves, and then we get burned out and we're useless. So actually, I don't know how you're feeling about the last couple of days, but I would propose that everyone in this room right now, including me, stop and take a deep breath. and that we do that about every 20 minutes of our lives. <laughs> and not only that, that we take some time out of every day to just stop, whether it's meditate, listen to music, just stop. Because in fact, it's not through being driven, through working half an hour longer that we're going to solve these problems. It's actually through some other processes, some of which are spiritual, some of which are psychological, some of which are interactional, that I think we're ultimately going to make a difference. We also, even though I think Americans have a wonderful tradition of partnership, tend to think that we can do it ourselves. And actually, again, these complex problems are hard to do ourselves. I mean, the quality about entrepreneurs that's so wonderful is that we have such incredible initiative, and we do go out there, and we do get a lot done. But if we actually have the illusion that we're really going to do these things by ourselves, then almost certainly we're going to be disappointed in ourselves and in the results. And finally, and this is again in some ways I think a very charming American characteristic that also can lead to misunderstanding, we tend to be very personal and outgoing and when we meet someone from another culture, we're so interested in them and we have a profound, deep conversation. And we tend to conclude that at the end of that conversation, we're best friends and we have complete trust in each other and total understanding. Well, given Americans' position in the world, our government, our country, etc., I hate to say this, but there's a profound distrust of America and to some extent of Americans. And we all come under that suspicion, and it takes a long time to get over it. And even if it's not specifically mistrust of Americans, not every culture makes friends as easily as we do. And so, again, sometimes we need to just pull back and go a little bit more slowly on that. So my next, I've talked about the passion. The second one is getting involved personally. What I really mean to say is that money is great and it's absolutely needed. But we as philanthropists, and I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, tend to have a number of advantages in our lives that make more than our money useful. And even if what we do isn't always necessarily 
useful. The process of taking the time to get to understand the problem will undoubtedly give us a better way of understanding the problem and therefore how we use both our time and our money will be more sensitive, more thoughtful, and ultimately more useful. So I would just say take the time to learn about whatever your passion is. Go there, whether it's to the country, to the village, to the organization. Go there and spend some time. Talk to people. Ask people. Listen to people. Read up on the situation. For me, as I said earlier, the best experiences in my lives were getting in my life were getting to live in the squatter settlement and later work in the anti-apartheid movement. And through Synergos, I've had the incredible privilege as we've worked to develop community foundations around the world and to develop a style of leadership which we call bridging leadership, was to get to spend time in a number of cultures over many years because we actually work through long-term partnerships so that in some cases, 17 years, we've been working with the same groups in the same country. Over time, one does develop trust and one's perspective does change. And how we've operated over time has actually changed quite a bit in response to what our partners were saying to us. So when you are getting involved personally, I would suggest that you figure out what, you, what are your personal qualities and skills that you have to bring to the equation? What are you good at? What do you like doing? What challenges you? What do you think you need to get better at? It took me personally a long time to figure that out. And I, I'll just give you one anecdote which was very key for me. I was very grassroots oriented. My commitment is still with the grassroots. Synergos works through intermediary organizations to the grassroots. but. Um, at one point, I had a chance to meet Oliver Tambo, who was then president of the African National Congress, and feeling a little awkward and shy, I said, Mr. President, I'd really like to help, but I imagine you don't want me to join your guerrilla forces. And he laughed and said, no, I don't. And I don't want you to get arrested in front of the South African Embassy either. We have a lot of people who can do that. We don't have many who can help connect us to the business community. So I want you to maintain your credibility with the establishment, with the business community, and help us make those connections. For me, that changed my whole life because it made me realize that regardless of what my personal preferences might be, my particular niche, I forgot to mention that as a member of the Rockefeller family, I have pretty good access, that my particular niche was in fact staying credible in those constituencies and maybe beginning to bring those constituencies in to meet groups that they might not otherwise feel comfortable with. The last of the three P's is have patience, which I've already alluded to. I think we need to be patient in seeking results. It takes time to find your passion. It takes time to find people who share your passion, to build trust with them, to build initiatives or institutions that can effectively address the issue about which you feel that passion. And finally, to produce significant results and foster positive social change. So that's a pretty big order in terms of learning to be patient. And in the course of that, that's not all. We need to listen. Listen to what people and organizations working on the issue we care about are saying and thinking, because chances are a lot of them have much more experience than we do. And particularly when we're working in another culture that they obviously know much better than we do. We need to spend the time to understand the cultural and sectoral differences, almost of language as well as perception, to learn other people's ways of thinking, of communicating, as well as learning to communicate ourselves across those boundaries. Otherwise, we may actually share a political vision or a social vision, but we may not be able to communicate about it, and therefore, working together, we may not be so effective. And finally, it takes time to connect with an organization or a group of people that are working on the issues we want to address, especially if it's a group from another country where we have those cultural issues that we have to address, and um, in order to leverage what we can bring to the table. So finally, in terms of what I think philanthropists have as 
advantages and challenges in participating in the social development field. And this is to get us to think beyond our money, because by the way, I always found it degrading when I used to have the name Rockefeller that that's all people thought about was the money. And that's great and it's useful, but I'd like to think that maybe I have some other things to bring to the table in addition to that. It takes a certain amount of identity development to get to that point. I would say at the age of 55, I'm finally there. Um, so one is that we're actually, most of us are privileged to have had a good and considerable education. And some of us even have some actual skills. We often have quite good contacts and networks. We are by virtue of the above and are, because of our financial resources, quite influential. That is to say, we can get in most doors, we can get a hearing, and we can make space at the table by virtue of keeping our foot in that door for others who wouldn't otherwise get in the door or to the table. So these are factors that, in my view, give us really the luxury to take risks, to take some time to get to know and understand the problem so we can be as effective as we possibly can, to build the kind of relationships that will mean that we can be effective together with others, not to or on others, to invest for the long term in people, in local institutions, and in the causes that we care about, and finally, to learn about the subject enough so that we can speak up effectively and influence the policy terrain as well as the practical development terrain. So to me, that is our challenge, to be and do all of those things. And I hope that we'll all not only do that within and with ourselves, but in some ways that we'll find ways of doing that together among this group and in particularly with groups in other countries that would love to collaborate and jointly build solutions to some of the problems that we face. Thank you. So now for the good part, Bono. I wish I could say that I was going to introduce him in person, but really what I'm going to do is introduce a video. I'm sure a lot of you uh, have had exposure to Bono because he's an amazing person. Over the last couple of years, he's really made human development a personal vocation. He has taken the message of development around the world. He's challenged presidents and peasants to work together for a brighter future. And he's also been a model for many of us in this room. With his money and fame, he didn't need to get involved, but he understood that by using his celebrity, he could reach people, particularly young people, with a message that many of them might otherwise not have heard. So, my friends, my fellow philanthropists, it's an honor to present to you one of the most powerful voices in philanthropy and in human development today, Bono. Musician. Some of you will be relieved uh, that I'm not here to sing today, but to pass on a message about Africa. I first visited Africa in 1995 to work at a feeding station run by World Vision in Ethiopia during the famine. Every morning I woke to see seas of people arriving, having walked for weeks towards their last hope. It was the most intense month of my life. When I was leaving, a man came up to me and put his young son into my arms. He said he wanted to give me his child to take home to Ireland, because there his son would live. I'm a father now, four children, that was hard to take. I went back to Ethiopia for the first time last year. It's finally at peace from the wars of past decades, but prosperity is far, far in the distance. Ethiopia is fighting a different kind of war now. No armies, no soldiers, no bullets. But last year alone, there were almost a quarter of a million casualties. The enemy 
is HIV AIDS. 2.1 million Ethiopians are infected with HIV. There are a million AIDS orphans, many of them living on the streets of Addis Ababa. The nightmare in Ethiopia is happening in many African countries, in Zambia, also one of the very poorest countries in the world, where one in five people have the HIV virus. The only industry booming in Zambia is death, coffins, especially for children, graveyards, funerals. It's hard to put into words. In Malawi, I visited a village where there was actually no middle generation of parents because of AIDS. Grandmothers struggling to feed 17 grandchildren, or worse, the Lord of the Flies syndrome, children bringing up children. So far, over 17 million Africans, mothers, fathers, teachers, priests, doctors, farmers, have died from this pandemic. Across the world's poorest continent, there are already 11 million children who have lost both parents to AIDS. Unless we act now, there will be 25 million AIDS orphans by 2010. Let me say that again. 25 million AIDS orphans by 2010. I know everybody has a cause. Rock stars in particular seem to collect them. But this is not a cause. This is an emergency. People say it will take a miracle to fight it, an act of God even. Well, I don't believe that. In fact, I think God is waiting for us to act. I believe that God Almighty is down on his knees begging for us to act. Love thy neighbor was not advice. It was a command. Well, Africa is our neighbor, and Africans are our brothers and sisters. And in a continent where most people live on less than a dollar a day, they cannot win this war alone. In the book of John it says, I think it's chapter 3, verse 16, First John, we know love, we know love by this, that he has laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need, and closes his heart against him. How does the love of God abide in him? Well, thankfully, the potential to beat this deadly pandemic has never been greater. Evidence from African countries shows <coughs> what works to stop people getting HIV. Prevention programs in Uganda have brought down the HIV rate from 15% of adults to 5%. In Senegal, uh, an aggressive education campaign has kept the HIV rate at less than 1%. And for people who already have AIDS, life-saving drugs exist. The Lazarus effect, they call it. The Lazarus effect means that a person taking antiretroviral drugs can move from death's door back to work within three months. Thank God. Thank God for those drugs and for the people who worked on them. The question is, what can we do to help? You already are, I know, through essential work that you're doing with partners in African countries to help the poorest of the poor, and, and what you're doing here to raise awareness. But the, scale, the scale of this AIDS pandemic requires a response at all levels, including our governments. There's a growing bipartisan consensus in the United States that this is not just an unprecedented humanitarian tragedy, but also a threat to peace and stability way beyond the shores of the African continent. The moral case, which stands alone, is increasingly supported by an economic and security case. In his recent State of the Union address, President Bush showed what America is for, as well as what is against when he announced a bold new vision to fight AIDS in Africa. It was a turning point for America. And if we can get it right, a turning point for the AIDS pandemic, we really need you to support the US government in leading this fight, to encourage the administration and Congress now to tackle the AIDS emergency rapidly and boldly.
I think we're all leaving this conference with a sense of the challenge, both for philanthropy and for policy, but I hope we're also all leaving it with a sense that, that is, these are challenges that can indeed be met. Um, this philanthropy is about partnership. This conference has also been about partnership. I want to particularly thank our partners at Stanford University for all of their help. I think philanthropy and this conference are also about heart, and I want to thank our speakers for that. And I want to thank the members of the World Affairs Council staff who all got up at 4 in the morning each day to drive down here to be here at 6. Ari Nair is going to hold me up for human rights abuses very shortly if Ken Ross doesn't get me sooner. Uh, but I want to particularly thank Susie Antunian and Glenn Gaylish and, and Juliet Shimon and Mark Reagan and Wes Stringfellow. Philanthropy is also about a combination of due diligence and extraordinary leaps of faith. And for that, I'm forever grateful to John and Pasha Morgridge and to Kate Greswold, to Paul Brett, uh, to Susan Bell, to Smith Singh, and, and uh, Marnie Sigler, and Barbara Metz at, uh, at Hewlett. But I'm particularly grateful to them because they introduced us and me to a magnificent human being like Julia Schumann.